bringing us to a place where somewhere between 10 and 30 of our states have um, constitutional provisions or protections, either impl- like explicit in their constitutions or interpreted by law, by courts, um, uh, we could see a real powerful federal victory. From the ACLU, this is At Liberty. I'm Kendall Seesmeyer, your host. Last month, a district court judge in Montana ruled in favor of 16 youth plaintiffs in a landmark climate lawsuit. In Held versus Montana, young Montanans ranging from ages 5 to 22 sued the state, arguing that lawmakers have consciously prioritized the development of fossil fuels over the well-being of Montana's residents and the protection of Montana's natural resources. This case marks the first time that a U.S. court has declared a government's constitutional duty to protect people from climate change. Not only does this case model how young people can engage with the legal system, it also sets precedent for similar lawsuits, proving state constitutions as a viable pathway to scoring seemingly unlikely civil rights and liberties victories. Joining us today is Matt Dos Santos, an attorney for Our Children's Trust, the legal nonprofit group that brought the case on behalf of the youth, and Claire Vlasas, one of the youth plaintiffs, who is a student at Claremont McKenna College. Together, they'll explain what it took to get this case off the ground and what implications it could have for the future. Matt, Claire, welcome to At Liberty, and thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having me. Thank you. So I have to start by congratulating you both on such a significant victory in Held versus Montana. This is the nation's first youth-led constitutional climate case to go to trial, We're going to speak in depth about how this case got built, but can you give us the top line, Matt? What were the plaintiffs arguing and what did the judge ultimately decide? Um, So great, Kendall. Thanks so much for having us. Claire and I are just super stoked to be talking about this with the ACLU. At the highest level, the case held versus the state of Montana was about these 16 youth plaintiffs who were suing their government for not protecting their constitutional rights. Um, What that looked like was not protecting the right to a clean and healthful environment, which was explicit in the Montana Constitution, but also it was things that we think of as being in other constitutions, right? Like the right to dignity, the right to life and liberty, the right to safety, um, the right to equal protection under the law. And the judge found that all of those rights were tied to this right to a stable climate, right? So that none of the rights in the Constitution that she found to be violated by the state's actions made any sense unless there was a stable climate for these youth plaintiffs to exist in. And that makes a lot of sense because how do you have life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, right? I'm talking about the federal Constitution now, If you don't have clean air to breathe, or if you're like the community around you is constantly on fire, or if water isn't drinkable. And so at at, at its core, this case was about fundamental constitutional rights that we know exist in Montana and around the rest of the country, and how they're tied to a stable climate. Matt, thank you so much for that overview. I think it's really helpful to just start there. Did you anticipate the success that you received, Claire? Like going into this as a plaintiff yourself, were you optimistic? Um, <laughs> that's a hard question. I guess it didn't matter to me so much if we would win or not, really. It was just that um, I could get my voice out there and talk about how climate change has impacted me. And I guess I was pretty preoccupied about how um, the court proceedings would go and you know, all the legal information to really be thinking about wanting a a positive decision. Although that just came naturally, I guess. And so Matt, what about you? Knowing what you know about how hard it is to win in any climate, let alone the kind of legal climate that we're currently in, were you surprised? So by the time we got to trial, I wasn't surprised. We start out with understanding that 
we have, like, at principle, we know that we are right. And we know that this case is winnable. And so I knew all of that. And, I, you know, like, I'm somewhat of a realist, having litigated cases like this and other constitutional cases for decades now, that they are really hard to win. And you never know how much you're going to win. So to have, like, this level of victory where literally all of our claims that made it to trial... Uh, the judge found in our favor, um, in Claire's favor, really, and uh, and to have such a resounding 103-page opinion penned that really went through all of the plaintiff's harms, all of the scientific testimony by experts in, in their field, um, and, um, and and really tied all of the underlying claims of harms to Montana's contribution to the climate crisis. Like, that was a resounding victory that I don't think, frankly, any of us could have expected. But I wasn't surprised we won, because um, I think, as Claire will share with you, the experience at trial was interesting in that the state sort of stopped putting on a case after about a day. And they didn't call a number of their expert witnesses. They didn't call a number of their factual witnesses. And I think after they saw Claire and and their and and her co plaintiffs testify as well as the experts testify, that they knew they didn't have uh, much of a chance of of winning on the facts. So Claire, I have to turn to you naturally because Matt just teased that you presented you and your other co plaintiffs presented such a compelling testimony and compelling slate of facts that it really sounds like it silenced the other side. Can you speak to your own experience testifying? Yeah, um, I, I think all of the plaintiffs shared how climate change has impacted them and specifically connecting all of our love for Montana and the land and the landscape of the state that makes us people and, and how that is impacted by climate change. So. For me, I find a lot of my identity within um, Montana landscape. That being said, I I grew up on a small farm, so I raised ch- chickens and sheep and had a big garden. And from that, like from a very young age, I I've always had a real respect for nature and for the land and what it can provide for me. And being an avid outdoorsman and um, a big skier, I have been watching climate change impact the environments I've grown up with. And so um, it wasn't it wasn't difficult to speak with passion about that on the stand. Yeah, it sounds like it. I mean, I'm just curious, like if we would want to highlight a few of the other stories as well that that you kind of collectively represent. Well, uh, there's Ricky. She has a huge farm in eastern, um, huge ranch in eastern Montana. And um, climate change has completely impacted her ability to raise cattle and her family's livelihood there. There's Georgie. She's a huge ski racer and her ability to ski race is completely um, affected by climate change to the point where she can't train as much as she needs to. Um, There's Lander and Badge. They are from um, northern Montana, and they're big hunter and fishermen. And as climate change decimates the environment of Montana, it impacts, I mean, their, their food sources. And then there's a multiple indigenous uh, plaintiffs particularly Sariel, had a compelling story where a lot of her tribe's stories are related to snowfall. And as less and less snow falls, their ability to pass down stories is is withering. So those are just a few, a few of the people, but it's all really emotional. Thank you so much for sharing that, Claire. I really appreciate you, like, um, sharing your collective stories. Um, I think that that's really cool that you are not only representing yourself, but you're representing this amazing collective of 16 young people who 
are really the future of Montana and are seeing their future be denigrated by climate change. The state, as you know, is full of natural beauty and natural resources. And so when you have a state that is so much of the life is the outdoors, is the land, I think that's really significant. And we also know that Montana is the country's fifth largest producer of coal and its 12th biggest oil producer. And multiple state lawmakers have spent time in the oil, gas, and coal industry. I think the juxtaposition between the kind of extraction or the over-extraction of Montana's natural resources and then being on the front lines of climate change, the fires every year, the melting snow, the glacier for lakes, you know, there's just a lot of evidence um, that you can feel, it seems. How do you think that this, if at, at all, elevated your case and your position? And, and was there something about Montana specifically that you think makes it unique in this way that that so much of life is centered around um, the land and 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 yet that land is being brutalized in ways that perhaps it's not in other places. Um, I think I mean the the biggest thing that makes Montana unique and in a good position for a case like this is what Matt was saying earlier about our our constitution having special rights for the protection of the environment. Um, But I think that just goes to say that the people in Montana care a great deal about um, the land and what what it offers. So whether um, you come from a very conservative ranching family background, or if you are, you know, supportive of more liberal policies in protection of the environment. Either way, like Montanans care a lot about our state and we're really proud to be part of Montana and we want to do everything we can to protect it for future generations. Matt, do you have anything to add? I mean, I just really think that what Claire said last is just so important to reiterate, which is that irrespective of where you fall on the political spectrum, the world around you matters. And at the end of the day, we all need a habitable planet. The other thing, in, and I think it is, it's true that Montana was uniquely positioned in the sense that the Constitution was written in the 70s, like early 70s, has a specific provision about the clean and healthful environment. And ultimately, was um, that 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 provision was tied to all of the other fundamental rights at at stake. But I think it was very clear, too, from Judge Seeley's opinion that the other rights could have been tied to a clean and like it could have been tied to a stable climate even without that provision. So um, where people might say, okay, well, Montana's unique, like this, you know, this case will work in Montana and maybe the handful of other states with green amendments. Mm-hmm. We think that's wrong. And we think it's wrong because as I said, you know, at the outset that these constitutional provisions just literally don't make sense if you don't have a habitable environment. So to pick up where you're going with this, you know, one study, this was from an article in The Grist that says that one study found that 59% of respondents younger than 25 see climate change as a constant worry, and 39% say that concern impacts their daily lives. Um, Young activists, we've seen it all around the world, have repeatedly begged world leaders to take action. But even as those in power applaud their efforts, emissions continue to climb and extraction continues to increase. Claire, what is your take on this? Why do you think this is so clear to young people that isn't as clear to older people? Climate change has significantly impacted the lives of of young people. And we are particularly vulnerable because our livelihoods, I mean, our lives and lifespans like extend into the future, which is predicted to be um, dangerous to live in. I mean, in school growing up, we we see graphs and we see data of, of what climate change will look like. And especially during the trial, my eyes were really open to how drastic uh, the effects of climate change could and, and will be if action isn't taken. Um, and and knowing that, you know, like 20, 2050, 
2060, like those are years not in the not too distant future, years that will impact my own life and and my children's lives. Mm. Matt, why was it so important to center young people in this case? Was that part of the strategy or did that just come naturally? I mean, I think it's always been a part of the strategy at our Children's Trust. So all of our cases are brought by youth and and the youth are very involved in every decision that we make. And that's because they're disproportionately harmed, not just because they're going to live longer lives, but also because their young bodies are harmed by pollution in a way that older bodies that aren't developing, our brains are formed, our lungs are formed. A temporary political solution isn't one that we're after. We're after a declaration of constitutional rights. We're after long-term, um, meaningful systemic change. And in terms of evidence, you know, aside from the plaintiff testimonies, how are you able to prove that the state has made deliberate choices that counter the fight against climate change or that actually inhibit or harm the health and safety of Montanans? We brought in river and lake and stream biologists, glaciologists, um, doctors who talked about physical harms, psychologists who talked about mental health harms and impacts. We brought in cultural experts, so indigenous leaders, to talk about the ways that their lives were being impacted by not being able to pick first foods, right? Like huckleberries or or hunt um, on indigenous lands and how um, Mm -hmm. they couldn't teach, for example. So we did this in a very choreographed way where we had a plaintiff testify, an expert testify, and that expert would support the testimony of the plaintiff and try to weave a really compelling narrative for how we could see all of these various harms throughout the state of Montana and then tie them directly back to you know, our policy expert who talked about how by excluding the consideration of climate change, and frankly, one of the things Montana did that made it easier for us is they never denied a fossil fuel permit, period, ever. And they've, oh, wow. they've denied numerous sustainable energy permits and made like numerous restrictions. So Montana's actions were just very clear in how their policies were, were uh, despite knowing uh, about the harms they were having, were just in furtherance of the fossil fuel industry. How will this victory be used to kind of determine whether or not a, let's say, a fossil fuel permit can be granted or or is banned? What will happen from here? I think we know for a fact that the state is going to appeal this decision. And while there is no stay on the case, so sometimes there's a stay yeah. issued by the judge, which means that the decision can't go into being enforced right away. This one, there's no stay right now. We expect the state to ask the Supreme Court to stay it. This is going to all happen very quickly. We would rather the state appeal to the state um, Supreme Court now, just so we can uh, you know, go up while the record is fresh and try and get a decision from the Supreme Court In this moment, we think the Supreme Court of Montana is really well positioned to affirm this decision, um, both just looking at the composition of the court and the record in the trial court. And then we're going to see if the state doesn't start taking some clear actions around both considering climate change and also the harms to young people that these potential fossil fuel projects would have, I think you'll see enforcement actions brought by the plaintiffs and um, on behalf of organizations to to enforce this ruling. Thank you for that. I think it's, it's helpful to kind of know what we actually can expect to see from here, from this decision. Um, you mentioned that Claire has actually experienced um, the state make deliberate choices um, to impede climate solutions. Um, so Claire, I would love if you would tell me about your first experience trying to navigate um, state policy and and seeing yourself and your climate solution be hindered. Yeah, I've always loved the environment. And so even when I was a lot younger, I was doing everything I could to promote environmental work in my community. And so when I was in middle school, I raised 
around $120,000 for solar panels on my middle school. And that amount was the amount needed to put a 50 kilowatt um, solar installation system onto the school. And, and that number is the maximum amount that the state of Montana allows such that the energy still works in the, the grid buyback system. So any other, any more um, panels would, wouldn't make as much um, financial sense. And so even though I raised enough money for a 50 kilowatt system on, on my school and two other schools and actually a facilities building too, um, I, I still only put on um, the amount that's like covers about a quarter of each school's um, electricity every month um, because there's legislation that exists to prevent large installations for bigger buildings which in my case, um, I don't know, it doesn't, it doesn't solve the problem. <laughs> I think middle schoolers have this amazing um, way of seeing problems and seeing simple solutions, right? Like big, big, big tasks ahead of them, but believing in these kinds of believing in themselves and their power to make solutions happen um, in ways that sometimes like adults kind of get bogged down by. Um, but when you, so you're, you're in middle school and you're pursuing this solution and you raise all of this money, which is so impressive. And then you're told, no, well, you can't quite do that. How did that change your either outlook on the climate crisis or government inefficiency. I don't even know if that would have resonated at that age, but like, how did that impact you? Yeah, um, it was pretty crushing because it was, um, it was already a lot of work to, to reach the goals, my fundraising goals. Um, when I first presented the idea when I was in seventh grade to the architects and contractors, um, my school is going through a remodel, so um, I was in a good position to make the school ready for solar panels. Um, when I first presented the idea to them, I was just immediately shut down and told, no, it wasn't feasible um, because of the cost. And so um, middle school, need, I mean, I didn't have any idea of how much $120,000 really was. I just figured it was something I could do. And so when I did it, um, and then was told, no, again, it's not, it's not going to go all to your school. We'll have to divide it up. I mean, I'm still happy that, that I can help all schools, but, um, it is sad to hear that there's just even more barriers to actually succeeding, um, especially as a young person who doesn't, who didn't understand at the time what any of it meant. And then when I was in high school, I worked on legislation that would take that 50 kilowatt cap um, out of effect. Of course you did. And it was shut down in, in committee. <laughs> and I helped write other solar legislation that all never made it out of committee because it wasn't a priority for my legislators, even though it was one for my. And so then you were like... I'm going to sue you. <laughs> challenge me once, challenge me twice, challenge me three times. I might just have to join a lawsuit to sue the state of Montana. <laughs> well, I couldn't vote yet. And, um, and I wanted to make sure that my voice was heard, even though um, I couldn't elect the officials. I, I mean, I'm still a working member of society. And so... Um, I mean, I still pay taxes. That's right. So I wanted to um, do everything that I can. I mean, I wouldn't even identify as an environmental activist. I'm really just someone that cares a lot about my farm and the mountains that surround my town and my state. And so really for me, it's just about protecting my livelihood, which is in the land. Claire, you're a boss. <laughs> I think that's that's so cool. Um and you know, I just I'm so grateful that you have persistence. Um and that's part of your 
I can tell that that's part of your ethos <laughs> as a person. Thank you. <laughs> you know, we, we've said that this is a historic case and that we are going to, and, and Matt, you even admitted at the very beginning that we're, you're hoping to take this victory and, and go big with it and file other similar lawsuits and other cases. You know, obviously Montana is one of the, the states that have codified environmental rights. At the ACLU, we talk a lot about how state constitutions can have have become this kind of new way to secure civil rights and civil liberties. What do other states have in their constitutions and like what can we use there? And yeah, where are you going to go from here and how does this all piece together in your kind of strategy at Our Children's Trust to levy these cases across the country? Yeah. I mean, let me start by saying that there have been lots of other really incredible lawyers and civil rights advocates who have in some ways paved the way for this, um, so this, this, what I think of as like a campaign for justice around young people's rights. Recently, we saw this in the really, or like, um, the groundswell of cases around marriage and, um, giving, uh, same-sex couples, access to rights, um, which result, while it result, like Obergefell was the, the case that we think of as giving um, same, same-sex couples the right to, to marry. Uh, there were numerous state constitutional cases that were um, hard fought, some won, some lost from 1996 in Hawaii all the way through 2015, right, when Obergefell happened. So this strategy of looking at state constitutional um, provisions and in order to advance uh, law at a national level is not something that we invented. Um, but it right. is it's a but it is a pattern that we think is worth emulating and that these rights are really incredibly important. And so we're taking Montana, and so we have cases in um, Utah right now that's currently before their Supreme Court. The Supreme Court of Utah actually took the case from the trial court level, skipped the Court of Appeals. The ACLU is involved in that case, and, uh, and the ACLU of Utah and National are filing an amicus brief in that case, which will be really powerful about the um, you know plaintiffs' rights to bring those cases, like to have standing um, to bring those cases. Um, we have a case in Virginia. Uh, we have um, a case in Hawaii that is going to, to trial in, in June of this coming year. Mm. Um, we also have the Juliana case, which is in the District Court of Oregon, but a federal court. And so bringing us to a place where somewhere between 10 and 30 of our states have um, constitutional provisions or protections, either impl- like explicit in their constitutions or interpreted by law, by courts, we could see a real powerful federal victory, um, in, mm. at the, the, the federal level and, or, you know, through legislative processes. So the other thing I think that is important here is that I think some people might be listening to this conversation and might think, well, climate justice, climate issues, that's not a civil rights or civil liberties issue. There is a lot of intersectionality that comes into play when we talk about climate change, about climate justice work, about rights to a healthful environment. What's the argument for for climate justice from a civil rights perspective, from an indigenous justice perspective, from a racial justice perspective? I'll just quickly say my story, which is um, I was doing all of this work, especially I have worked on LGBTQ issues a lot. It's a personal issue for me. Um, Immigration is a personal issue for me. Uh, My parents are both immigrants, naturalized citizens way after I was born. And my my partner um, at one point said to me, like, all of the work that you're doing is incredibly important, but I'm really worried that the world is going to burn down around us. And I said, you can't think of things that way. But that, like, got stuck in my head. And I couldn't, like, I, I literally couldn't stop thinking about how all of this other work that I was doing around securing individual rights could just 
literally go up in smoke. And it kind of altered the course of my career. And so it, for me, it, it, it really is meaningful because I know that communities of color and um, the disability community, um, these are people in, in like communities with like very little socioeconomic means. These are the communities that will be first and hardest impact and have the longest um, impacts along with youth communities, right? Like, so uh, fighting for climate justice to me feels like a just profoundly um, important way to fight for justice, like capital J justice. Absolutely. I want to ask you really, as we're kind of wrapping up here, what did the victory mean to you, Claire? And did it change any of your outlook on what was possible in climate activism or the future of Montana? Yeah, um, the decision is life changing, and and not just for me, but for young people across Montana and hopefully around the world. I've always worked for um, environmental work in my community, and it's it's led to a lot of challenges and hurdles, especially as a young person. And this case has changed that around for me completely. It's like the first time I feel like I've won anything. You know, it's really nice to finally be heard. Um, and validated that climate change is real and it's happening because a lot of times um, it can feel like it's all made up, <laughs> but it's not. And so the decision, I hope, um, will leave a lasting impact on how Montana as a government runs. It will leave an impact on how our policies will be made in the future. Amazing. I think it's incredible the work that the two of you have done. Claire, other young people are listening to this. They're hearing your story. They're hearing your persistence. Um, they might feel the same way as you, that they it's an uphill battle, that they might not ever win. What kind of advice would you give for other young people who are, who are trying to levy the same kind of fight in their states and their communities? I mean, I don't think it takes you know, someone special to be the one doing this. Like like I was saying about all the other plaintiffs, um, we're all just young people who who care. I mean, as a young person, it feels like the power to make change is not in your hands a lot of times, especially if you're too young to vote or run for office yet. Um, but this case, this decision, and the environmental work that young people do every day is are all examples of how that's not true. Amazing. Well, thanks to both of you for for coming on and, and chatting with me about this. This has been so, so cool. Um, I was so excited to see your big victory. And um, yeah, I just really deeply appreciate the work you're doing. And uh, thank you for sharing your time with me. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having us. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to At Liberty wherever you get your podcasts and rate and review the show. We really appreciate the feedback. At Liberty is a production of the ACLU, produced by me, Kendall Seesmeyer, and Vanessa Handy. This episode was edited by Matt Boynton. Until next week, stay strong.